Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us for the October DAC Monthly Webcast. I'm Jennifer Stafford, the Director in the Division of Assessment and Accountability Support, and we welcome you today to this special broadcast. We have a lot of exciting news to share with you. We had a Kentucky Board of Education meeting yesterday. They held a retreat on Tuesday and their regular board meeting on Wednesday, and we look forward to sharing with you information that was shared with them as well as next steps on the accountability regulation. Today, joining me is uh, two consultants in our division. Shara Savage is going to share updates on uh, ACT as well as the, as the end of course. And Pam Powers is here with us as well, sharing a new helpful resource in the DAC calendar. We hope that this uh, calendar is beneficial for you as you begin uh, to look at deadlines and trainings and uh, a lot of good, helpful resources with that, with that calendar. And as always, Pam is taking your questions. So along the way, we'll stop and pause for questions that you may have on the particular topics. And you can email those questions to dacinfo at education.ky.gov. So Helen is here with us. Helen, if you would, please pull up the PowerPoint for us. And um, as you're doing that, uh, we can uh, talk through the agenda a, a little bit more. We have, um, again, the Kentucky Board of Education met yesterday at its regular meeting, and we'll share, uh, I'll share updates with you. Um, then Shara will go into uh there is a release that's a standard release for, from the ACT. Um, it's the grad class release. Um, it's the graduating class of 2020 release. And uh, we want you to understand that it is happening on October 14th at the same time as our uh, school report card here in Kentucky is being released. So we want to make sure that you understand that there is a difference between that. Um, so then go into uh, ACT updates. We have had a fall administration here and it's going quite well. Um, this past Tuesday, October 6th, was the makeup date and we have one more to go. So we hope that uh, it's going well for your students and they are getting the statewide administration opportunity to take that they were unfortunately uh, unable to get in this past spring. Uh, after that, she'll go into some uh, end of course. We have end of course available for our students um, that are um, in the early graduation program. And there are some exciting changes to that program. So we've got uh, some piloting going on that Cher is gonna share with you and um, some exciting new features that is going to uh, be uh, for your students and for your, our administrators. So uh, Cher is gonna also provide that information. Then we'll turn back uh, to me and go to the uh, school report card. We're gonna talk about the timeline for uh, public release. We're also gonna share with you some next steps. Um, it'll begin tomorrow with the release of the data to our districts. So uh, we're, I'm gonna share with you uh, some information about how uh, and where to access the, the data. So uh, I'm gonna go uh, into uh, a little bit of detail on that. I'll turn over to Pam then and talk through um, the DAC calendar so um, that you have a, a good understanding of the DAC calendar as well as uh, some functionalities within that because uh, this was created as a resource that was asked for from our district assessment coordinators. So uh, we really want to adhere to and take advice from our district assessment coordinators. So she's going to talk through that valuable resource. Um, and again, we'll take questions along the way. Uh, so at this time, um, it uh, looks like that we've got the agenda up. So if we will uh, go to the next slide, I'll start with the update on the development of the accountability system. 
So yesterday, uh, we had a discussion with the Kentucky Board of Education. And uh, during that discussion, we talked about uh, multiple uh, topics during that, uh, that presentation. Um, we first started with the fact that the assessment and accountability, although they are intertwined, are actually two separate things. So uh, assessments uh, and accountability are both statutorily required, and the Kentucky Board of Education has responsibilities with those two systems. So as district assessment coordinators, as you are talking about assessments and accountability, there are particular pieces and um, differences between those two systems. They're interrelated, but they are uh, different. Um, the assessment system is the uh, tests that are given and the measures of which we understand and get student performance data. Um, I don't know if it's Helen at this point, but go if you would go to the next slide because I'm talking about the difference between assessments and accountability. Um, so those uh, assessment are those things that measure the students um, and um, elicit information from the uh, from the students. So those those are those measures. It's the reading test three through eight in high school. It's the math test. Um, in uh, three through eight in high school. It's the social studies, the science, the on-demand writing, the editing mechanics. Those pieces are the assessment system. The accountability system relies on those measures, but the accountability system is those uh, pieces that come together and uh, classify our schools. Those are the indicators that all come together that uh, we report annually to our schools district and the public. So if when you think about accountability, it's those indicators. It's uh, the uh, academic indicators of uh, state assessment results. It's the progress toward English language proficiency for our ELs. It's our quality of school climate and safety indicator. It's our grad rate indicator. It's all of those different indicators that go into bringing about that annual meaningful differentiation of our schools. So as district assessment coordinators and building assessment coordinators and others that are listening, that those are uh, the differences between the assessment system and the accountability system. And so they're intertwined. They are needed uh, for each other and both are both statutorily required for both our state and our federal statutes. So there are, there are requirements, both federally as well as state, for both assessment and accountability. They're intertwined, but different. Um, if you would uh, go to the next slide, please. So as we started discussing with the board, there are immediate uh, needs and immediate decisions that are needed from the board. Um, the first one, uh, and we are, we're calling it this triple track um, discussion because there are immediate needs, there are uh, long-term needs, and then there are some uh, decisions in between. So when we when we think about what our, is our immediate need is, it's immediately that we need to talk with the board about design decisions about the accountability regulation. Um, we need uh, direction on that regulation. Senate Bill 158 was approved last general session and it brought about significant changes to our accountability system. Uh, so we must have changes to our current accountability regulation. And so therefore, we need direction from the board to make those changes because we want their guidance and direction for that development of the accountability system. Then we'll move on to the, uh, the next um, step in our track, which is more uh, of a decision 
on um, building a foundational process for improved assessments. Um, there are uh, discussions at the Board of Education uh, over the past uh, few months that they would like to review our assessment systems. So that is something that we can work toward, maybe first get their information and their concepts and understanding of the direction that they would like to, to go with our assessment system. And then we can start taking some incremental steps to reach those goals that the board has for our assessment system. And then the, the third track is kind of that long term, that long term transformational assessment system that better supports instructions for our students in Kentucky so that they are growing and meeting the, uh, the goals that have been set for them as learners. So it's those long range, those long range trans transitional goals that the, the board wants to reach. So we've got these, these three tracks. The first track is immediate. The second, time we, the second track, we can take more incremental steps and then this long-term uh, approach. So the next slide um, will provide uh, the steps to get there. So October, in yesterday's board meeting, it was an overview of the uh, requirements that are statutorily required, both federal and state. So with the board yesterday, we talked through uh, the, these slides. We actually used these slides with them. We also went a little bit further with them in the comparison between the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act statutorily requires, and then what is required in uh, Senate Bill 158 and those changes. So yesterday was an introduction to uh, the, these steps that are needed and the changes needed for the regulation. The board has expressed interest in taking a deeper dive into the accountability regulation so that they uh, can have a more uh, in-depth, thoughtful discussion about the accountability system. So um, we're trying to schedule very soon, within the next several weeks, a working session with them on the accountability system. We think that's going to happen in November um, so that we can set up then and be prepared for um, discussions with the local superintendent advisory council in late November, as well as our school curriculum assessment and accountability council in uh, mid-November. So this, this work, accountability working session needs to happen within the next few weeks so that we can prepare then um, for those critical inputs from those, those working committees. Then in December, then to have a full, a full reading of the accountability regulation. It'll be the first read of accountability. So there'll be a draft regulation uh, discussed at the December board meeting. At that same meeting, then we'll have a separate topic on assessment and introduction to assessments. Similar to what we did yesterday with those statutory requirements around accountability, we plan to come to them in December with a comparison of what is required both federally and by the state for assessments. So we'll begin that discussion in December. Then uh, move on with uh, into our February meeting with a, a developed accountability regulation for a second read. Um, then continue with those design, design decisions on the assessment, all trying to get us incrementally stepping toward those long-term system designs of those two very separate but interrelated uh, uh, systems. If you would new, move to the next slide, please. So the impact um, on our accountability system is significant. We've, we've said that a couple of times and um, it brings about uh, multiple changes. Next slide, please. So Senate Bill 158 um, was a transformational piece of legislation because it um, limits in many ways the um, inclusion 
of what is included in accountability. So um, there is this word in the statute that says um, exclusively. So uh, there are a set of indicators within Senate Bill 158 that uh, limits the inclusion of components that schools and districts in the state is held accountable for. So um, the performance also has this, this piece of status and change. We've done status for, for many, many years. Um, that's what our accountability system has been based on for years. It's that current year performance of our schools and students within those schools and our districts. Senate Bill 158 brings into play this concept of what's called change. And the change is that performance by school on each of those indicators. So if you think about uh, an indicator uh, such as um, our proficiency or what will be called state assessment results for reading and math, because that's the, the terminology that was used in Senate Bill 158, change would be the performance of the, the school or the difference between that indicator from the prior year to the current year. So that is a very new concept for Kentucky and uh, one in which that is going to require a thoughtful consideration and a, a good bit of decision making to be able to implement that change aspect within the accountability system. So change is going to be uh, different and new. And um, in assessment, we we know different and new, and so we are uh, are used to the, those changes. So we'll we'll go through that. But that that word exclusively in the bill, in our interpretation, limits the amount of what is included in the accountability system. We've mentioned uh, status and change, and it requires the overall performance to be um, brought together uh, in an overall um, measure, and also it must be presented in the school report card in some light, some type of online dashboard. So uh, we are taking steps in, along the way. We are um, taking that um, steps toward that new accountability system um, in developing those regulations. Now, we created for um, comparison what the Every Student Succeeds Act and as well as Senate Bill 158, we've created this comparison document. It's a really simply laid out uh, table in that um, it shows by academic um, indicator that's required by ESSA, as well as how the Senate Bill 158 aligns to uh, those federal statute. It aligns quite closely, and what it does is it further defines what school accountability is for Kentucky. So we hope that uh, this um, document is useful to you um, as you think about uh, the requirements of the accountability system. It was used yesterday with the board to present to them some areas that um, the board could consider changing and that there's areas that the board doesn't need to change. So uh, as the it was developed, we wanted the board to know where the indicators needed changing as well as what didn't need changing so that we can just move move forward with that. So uh, we hope again that that will be a document that is useful to you as well. So um, next slide, please. So to get us to this uh, new accountability system, this new regulation, uh, those steps uh, are going to happen with the board and um, many ways we will engage um, our stakeholders. Um, we'll start first by having this work session uh, with the Kentucky Board of Education uh, to provide them the opportunity to um, 
show and demonstrate and voice what they value, what their goals are for an accountability system, and what their mission is to get us toward those those goals. In December, I mentioned we'll come back with the first read. A second read will be in February. Then we'll move into um, the spring with um, a 60-day public comment period in uh, March and April. We'll bring back a statement of consideration in June of next year, and hopefully then move into the legislative committees. Along the way, we'll have to update the ESSA consolidated state plan. So we'll have to have federal approval of any accountability system that um, makes that annual meaningful differentiation for our schools. And hopefully this time next year, we will have a new in-place intact accountability system. So let me pause there, Pam, because I, I know we may have some questions from our um, from our viewers and participants. So Pam, let me ask you if, if we have any questions about any of the information that we've shared on the assessment, or excuse me, the accountability. It would help if I unmute myself. <laughs> uh, yes, we've had one question come in. Will the November accountability working session be available for viewing? <clears throat> You know, I assume it will because it's going to be a public meeting. Um, generally, when the board meets, they it is um, um, under the, the requirements of a public meeting. Um, they It has to have the press release. It has to have that notification. Um, and um, I'm so, yes, I'm assuming that it would be... Um, able to be publicly viewed. And through a, a similar aspect of as they met yesterday. So uh, through the media portal, through uh, YouTube, live streaming. And so, um, yes, I, I would think that that it would be. And as well, in our emails, our Monday emails, we will keep you up to date on any developments of that special working session. Okay, that's all that's for now. now. Okay, well then, um, if you, if anyone that's watching continues to have questions, uh, please email Pam at dacinfo at education.ky.gov. And uh, as you're doing so, I'm going to turn to Shara and ask her about uh, the ACT, if she would open up her camera. I do want to mention that uh, the ACT graduating class data is a public release that ACT initiates and they annually release this data. Um, just think about this being a nationwide press release uh, for all the states across the nation who administer the ACT, whether it's statewide or, or individually um, on a national test date. So ACT uh, does this press release. It just happens to be on the exact same day that we are releasing our school report card. You know, if we took a dart and threw it at a calendar, we couldn't have hit the same date twice, but it is actually happening on the same day. So Shara's going to, to alert you so that our DACs and our BACs understand that this is happening, and especially if your superintendent um, or your educational leaders and district leaders within your, your school and district have questions about what is this piece of data and how is it different than the school report card and the information being released in the school report card so that you are well prepared and understand and are prepared for those questions if you receive them. So Shara. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, as uh, Jennifer said, um, we wanted you to be aware that uh, two separate uh, data releases are happening on the same day. Um, KDE is releasing data from um, uh, in the um, the school report card, and ACT is releasing data on the 2020 high school graduation gra graduating class uh, on October the 14th. 
Um, the ACT data includes uh, 2020 graduates that who took the ACT as sophomores, juniors, seniors, um, under the standard or extended time conditions and, and achieved a college reportable uh, composition composition score. Um, the most recent set of um, test information is used for students who test more than one time. So if they test it multiple times, the most recent uh, will be used. Um, ACT uh, will release uh, the data in the new online dashboard, which includes uh, the online reporting system and the TAA system, both which are housed at success.act.org. And if you have not established your uh, account at uh, success.act.org, I would encourage you to do so now. Um, uh, having access to the online reporting or the TAA system prior to spring 21 and prior to the, this data release cycle um, will ensure that, you know, you have a good experience um, uh, with getting this information and with the spring administration. It's also crucial that, uh, that districts um, establish their trusted agent. Uh, if you um, have not done so, um, please establish your trusted agent. And if you have any trouble, you can contact myself and I will get you um, set up um, with the correct people to, to assist you. Now, please note that the ACT data from the 2020 statewide administration uh, will not be reported in the school report card this fall. Um, once ACT uh, testing is complete this fall and a more complete set of data is available, um, the ACT state data will be released in the school report card. Okay, and so we can go to the next slide. Um, so I have some um, reminders, ACT reminders, uh, for the makeup day that just happened on October the 6th, and that is still the accommodations window that is still occurring. Uh, FedEx is pre-scheduled to pick up standard time materials on the day uh, after testing and accommodations or support materials on the Monday following the accommodations window last day for the October 6th date, October 6th test date. The standard uh, materials were scheduled to be picked up on October the 7th. The accommodations materials are scheduled to be picked up on October the 13th. The deadline um, for ACT to receive the uh, standard paper materials from the October 6th date is October the 19th. Um, so if you haven't done so, um, if you've not returned those secure materials from the September 22nd date or the October 6th date standard time materials, please package those materials for return using the appropriate return labels. Any 922 materials should be returned using the labels received in the 922 material shipment. Likewise, any uh, 10-6 materials, uh, standard materials, uh, must be returned using the labels provided when the 10-6 materials are delivered. Um, please do not contact uh, FedEx. Um, and if, if FedEx um, makes regular pickups at your school, have FedEx take the materials when they, uh, when they arrive and be, uh, be sure uh, to uh, return the answer documents uh, before the deadline. Another option for returning materials is to drop the materials off at a local FedEx, but you be sure to obtain and keep a receipt. Um, and I want you to note that, again, just a reminder, only answer documents that arrive by the deadline can be scored and reported. Therefore, reports will only include examinees whose answer documents arrive on time. And if you need any help, there's resources to help you to complete the activity can be found on the ACT State Testing web page. Or you can always contact me for assistance. Um, so next slide um, is some more ACT reminders 
for the emergency test date that's upcoming on October the 20th. All secure, standardized, um, time or non-college reportable testing materials needed for the October 20th test date should be ordered by close of business tomorrow. Um, directions for ordering the, the supplemental, uh, for ordering the materials can be found under the order materials section in the PAN user guide. Uh, DAX or BACs are able to, uh, DAX are able to track the material shipments uh, from ACT using the order and sh orders and shipment tracking feature in PAN. Um, if you need assistance, see the view status and shipment uh, information section in the PAN user guide. Um, request uh, ACT uh, authorized accommodations and English learner supports for examinees scheduled uh, for October 20th testing window in TAA. I just will uh, let you know that no new requests for accommodations can be submitted at this time. However, the ACT authorized accommodations form um, can be used for any previous um, previously approved accommodation requests for students who uh, will use accommodations during the emergency test window can be moved uh, to the October 20th uh, testing window. The accommodations materials um, must, uh, th must be ordered uh, along with any of your standard uh, time materials by close of business tomorrow. Uh, these materials cannot be requested from PAN. Your accommodation materials cannot be requested in PAN. You will need to uh, order um, by utilizing the ACT authorized accommodations form or contacting ACT customer support uh, at 800-553-6244 extension 2800 or you can always contact me for assistance with that as well. And just please uh, note all secure materials needed for the October 20th test date must be ordered by close of business tomorrow. There are no automatic orders for this emergency test window, so it is it is uh, crucial that you place those uh, orders by tomorrow uh, close of business. Um, <clears throat> test materials for the October 20th test date will begin to arrive in your school next week. If you don't receive them, uh, please let me know so I can assist you with that. And just a reminder, ACT will now permit students to complete non, the non-test portion of their answer document um, uh, on the day of the testing for this fall administration only. Uh, please ensure that examinees complete the non-test portion of their answer document before completing any other test activity of the day. Uh, when they are finished with that, instruct them to put that underneath their seat and then testing should uh, proceed. Uh, as always, please uh, adhere to all scheduled breaks as documented in the test administration manual and please submit an irregularity report if conducting the non-test portion activity the morning of testing. Please ensure that the school's entire testing population adheres to the same non-test procedure decision. Uh, a school should not have half their students come in prior uh, to test day to complete the non-activities while the other half uh, complete those non-activity uh, activities um, on test day. And um, uh, as always uh, on testing day, please ensure that all current COVID-19 guidance procedures are followed and an irregularity report is not required for the current COVID-19 guidelines, which includes wearing the mask all, uh, during the test. So if we'll go to the next slide, we'll switch gears here a little bit um, and talk about the early graduation pathway. Um, the uh, end of course um, uh, assessments, I have some reminders. Um, the ordering window uh, for uh, is now open for districts to order their EOC assessments. Uh, the DAC or designee will return the order reports and should be emailed to the attention of myself, Shara Savage, um, by November 13th. Um, and it, 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 even if you're ordering uh, for window three, 
all orders are to be submitted by November 13th. The DAC should include the name of any uh, back, the back or the backs in the bottom of the email. If a student uh, does not appear on the early graduation order report that's pulled in IC, but has been approved for the early graduation pathway and testing, uh, and will be testing this school year, uh, please add the student's SSID and uh, tests needed. When a student name does not appear, please ensure that the student is flagged correctly in IC. Students uh, must be flagged in the early graduation um, uh, as, a, as an early graduate in IC to receive those assessments. If the student um, is, is not testing the school year, uh, the student may be deleted from the order report. DAX should monitor EOC orders to ensure that the ordering aligns with the student individual learning plan. And on this slide, I have provided an example of the order form. The DAC or designees will uh, manually enter the test uh, order for the 2021 school year to include uh, indicating the appropriate test name, test date uh, for each student. An X should be uh, marked under the needed assessments for each student and the assessment window um, date stated. If a student will be taking the assessment in, in more uh, than one test window, the DAC or the DAC designee will need to add additional rows uh, for the student to ensure correct tests are ordered for the appropriate testing window. And just as a reminder, um, the early graduation pathway is a deliberate pathway for students in grades 9 through 11 who wish to move on when ready, receive a diploma from a district, and be eligible for acceptance in, the, in a Kentucky public or nonprofit university and colleges. The pathway provides a financial scholarship known as the early graduation certificate to support this action. EOC assessments are not required just to simply graduate early. Okay, and uh, we can move on to the next uh, slide. Um, I'm very excited uh, to, to announce this for you. Um, uh, we have uh, new for the 2020-21 uh, school year, the EOC assessment answer documents will be online in an electronic format. Uh, with the assistance of Hart County and Somerset Independent, OAA conducted a small uh, field test on the new online electronic answer document. And I would like to personally thank uh, Angela Frank and Cindy Ham for your willingness to help with this new testing process. Uh, the field testing uh, of the new online electronic document was successful and the uh, students in Hart uh, County enjoyed having the paper testing booklet and the online electronic answer document. Um, <clears throat> it is the expectation that all examinees will complete the EOC assessments by using the electronic answer document. If an examinee cannot um, respond to a test item on the electronic form due to an IEP or 504 or PSP, uh, special permission uh, to use paper answer documents may be requested. Please contact me for approval before ordering your materials. Um, I do want to make note that the EOC test booklets themselves are only available in paper format. No electronic version is available. And lastly, uh, I will be providing a short training video, a PowerPoint, and the teacher administration manual, and that those will be uh, forthcoming in, in, in November. So thank you, and those are all the updates uh, that I have at this time. Thank you. So, so uh, please, please pause, pause there, there just a moment. moment. And ask, I'm getting a little feedback. Uh, if we have any questions that have come in, and Pam, I, I bet that you do, uh, for either Shara or myself. You are correct, Jennifer. We do have some questions that have come in. Uh, right now, I don't have any for Shara. They all seem to be for you. Oh, you well, are Shara. the lucky person today. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. We had several people asking about uh, spring testing. Will we, be do, will we be doing spring testing in 2021? And that's a that's a really good question. One in which um, that um, we don't have a, a solid answer for. Let me I explain where we are at this situation. Um, Betsy DeVos, the secretary of the U.S. Department of Education, uh, came out with a letter, and in that letter, uh, it stated that states should not expect a waiver from testing in the spring. Um, there are uh, conversations still continuing at the federal level, and several states are pushing back on that um, requirement. Um, so, Kentucky, we are preparing for a spring assessment. That means that we are continuing to develop our uh, assessments. We are moving forward with online preparations for our uh, um, test uh, for K prep and the Kentucky Academic Standards. We are preparing our alternate assessments. We are preparing for our access and alternate access testing. We continue to march toward that end. We do know that uh, there is an election coming up uh, that um, has um, some potential that, um, that could change. Uh, so if there is any um, announcements that are final, I would not expect that until after the election. So uh, right now, uh, we are continuing to prepare for spring 21 assessments. Uh, and we are monitoring, we're engaged in conversations at the federal level um, and with our other states. We were um, on some sessions this past um, Monday and Tuesday with other states, and they continue to push back on that. Uh, we're in a predicament right now that um, it's um, so unique and uh, very, very difficult in um, the situation um, that we are as a society, that we are as a nation, that uh, we are moving toward taking steps to be prepared for the spring. Okay, we have a, one more question along that vein. What about accountability? Will we have accountability for the 2021 school year? So I am so happy that those two questions were separate because, uh, you know, assessment and accountability are two different systems. So uh, that's wonderful that you're asking separately about uh, assessment and accountability. Um, in the DeVos letter, it was not explicit about accountability. So uh, that was not addressed. And so moving forward, we continue again to look for guidance from the U.S. Department of Education. And so you may wonder, uh, you may think that, well, why don't we just move forward without approval from the U.S. Department of Education? And so, again, as we talked about early, there's statutory requirements on assessment as well as accountability. And so our federal Title I funds mm -hmm. And I said Title One, but there are there are many types of Title funds uh, that are related to those requirements. So, as assessment and accountability, we never want to put Kentucky in the situation that would impact our Title funds. So that's the reason it's so important to have those waivers from the department at the federal level, so that we never impact those title funds. Well, that's all the questions I have for Jennifer, but a couple have come in for Shara. We have people asking about uh, the EOC answer document. Oh, okay. How can they access it? Well, uh, that is going to come out uh, in, you have links uh, in the uh, test administration manual, and I'll be explaining all those uh, wonderful, exciting details in a, in a short uh, training video for that. 
But it will be and through have, uh, it will be through Microsoft Forms, though. If that, that's the system that we're using. Okay. And we have another question. Um, since we're having an electronic answer document, can we administer at home, or do we have to bring them into the building? No, no, they have to be in the uh, school building, and they have to be uh, proctored um, very closely by a uh, by trained school staff. Okay, and we have one on ACT. Okay. If students are eligible to do makeup for the ACT that could not test on October the 20th, is it still an option for them to do testing in the spring with the juniors? Yes. Yes, it is. We will have a similar uh, process that, that took place in the summer uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to identify those, those kiddos that, who have fallen through the cracks and still have not been able to test. And uh, yes, they, as seniors, they will be able to test with our, with our juniors this spring in 2021. Okay, that's all we have for the moment. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, so, uh, let me follow up, Shara, on um, a that question about bringing the the students into the building. Uh huh. Um, so, if a district or if they've wanted to socially distance and mask and do all of those things, um, they could do that in person. Um, at uh, uh, an alternate location, uh, yes. say, yes. for instance, uh, a civic center or a, 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 a church, a local church building that had uh, Wi-Fi access. Yes. Uh, if, if schools and districts wanted to do that, we, we would not put a barrier or refuse that, uh, yes. would we? I don't believe so, um, Jennifer. So thank you for uh, yeah, reminding me of that. So I appreciate that. So we're not advocating for that. Uh, and we we hope that, you know, the, the students can come into the building. Uh, they We hope that all those healthy at school guidelines can be um, utilized and that everybody is safe um, in any Type of situation, especially um, with testing. So um, again, that's uh, that's um, the goal is for our students and our staff to be healthy, and that's the the main priority. If you're able to do that in um, in person, then we would certainly support um, that being administered uh, at um, at the the school or a, an alternate location. Um, if uh, and only if the the school wanted to do that, right? And and as long as it's by train, proctor by trained school staff, yes. Correct, correct. All right. So uh, let's move now. Thank you, Shara. Let's Thank move you. now to uh, public reporting. Um, and if you would go to the next slide, we do have uh, the public release of the limited amount of data that. Um, we have for assessment and accountability. It's going to be October 14th. That's been uh, communicated uh, multiple times um, to our school report card contacts, to our district assessment coordinators, and to our superintendents and principals. So uh, we're working toward that public release. Now, tomorrow um, is October 9th. That'll be the first time that it will be available in the school report card to view. So the assessment um, data that we have available will include um, access and alternate access data. We'll also include graduation uh, rate data, both four, five year and combined. And then uh, we'll have new to the card, we will have trends as well as long term goals and measures of interim progress. So there are some graphics that are uh, pretty user friendly that demonstrate and present a graphic image of those trend lines and those long term goals. So those are the, the, the new features. There are other data in the card that will include the, our safety data, the school profile report data is there and available 
uh, for districts. So there are multiple other pieces of the card that's going to be made available um, tomorrow. So um, in addition to the school report card, the Office of Assessment Accountability, we're opening up the secure web application for updated spreadsheets. So we've worked through this data quality steps. We had the fall data review uh, back in August. Instead of having one quality control day um, in September, we had uh, quality control days. So we had um, an opportunity to review uh, those, those spreadsheets and all the data um, that are available for our schools and districts. So this is the next step toward that public reporting. So tomorrow, uh, the, in addition to the school report card link that districts will receive, you'll also be able to, as DAX, access the school, the secure web application and download those, uh, those updated files. Um, so the process to get all of those access to our, our districts um, will include two emails. So there'll be two emails coming to you tomorrow. Um, the first will be a special school report card contact and DAC email. So we're gonna combine this and you'll have uh, the link to uh, URLs as well as you will have credentials um, that will include a username and password. So that link in those, those username and passwords, you'll be able to click on, put the credentials in and open the school report card. So you'll get a look at how the school report card will look when it is opened next week for the public. So this is a, a preliminary review for our schools and districts. The second email that you will get will be specific to, to DAX. So the DAX will receive an email that will announce that the secure web application is open. It will have uh, information about uh, where to locate the and download those updated spreadsheets. And um, it will have information about um, the, the timeline and the fact that the non-disclosure for the embargo data is uh, required. So uh, tomorrow begins the district review of the school report card that gives districts a time to um, analyze, look at the data, prepare themselves uh, for what the data looks like and what the data are, as well as uh, get ready for discussions with the local media. On October 12th, which is Monday, Monday an email very similar to what the school report card contacts and DACs get tomorrow will go to working media. So on Monday, the working media will have the same URL and those same username and passwords um, that will get them into the information that you will have access to tomorrow. So at that time from October 12th, then till the data is made public on the 14th, our district leaders can uh, talk with your local media about um, the, the data, help them prepare a press release for the, your local newspapers. So if you uh, want to discuss individually with uh, working media, you can do that between the 12th and the 14th. We ask that you not share it, the data in any public way, in a meeting or anything like that, that will um, expose that information um, to, the, to the public before it's released on the 14th. So that's the reason for the uh, non-disclosure, the requirement for the non-disclosure. Uh, those can be kept on file at the local school district, um, none of which have to be returned to the, um, the department. So DAX can collect those and um, you can share that information. Um, so as long as you have that non-disclosure, that non-disclosure. So again, Tomorrow, you're going to get DAX, district assessment coordinators will get two emails, one for information from the school report card to 
get you access to that. Then the second will be information on the <clears throat> secure web application and the updated files on that. Local media, then next week, and the public release, then on Wednesday of next week. Um, Pam, the, let me ask, okay, the next uh, slide, as I mentioned, there will be uh, access, alternate access, graduation rate data, long-term goals. The long-term goals and measures of interim progress include um, uh, academic pieces that, that we have um, to report. Now, the baseline for those long-term goals were set in 2019. And that's the last time we had assessments. So there will be the, the demonstration of the long-term goals for um, proficiency. You will have the information on the actual assessments of English learners, as well as your graduation rate in those long-term goals. So whether or not you've met those goals or exceeded or not um, on those two pieces. Uh, again, proficiency, since we didn't test in the in 20 um, for reading and math and our other content areas, that will just be the, the goals and those measures of interim progress. And, but for the graduation rate and proficient, EL proficiency, you will actually have those long-term goals and whether or not you met those. Uh, the final piece is the trends. So the trends toward state goals and uh, the actual performance um, toward those trends will also be um, available for those. So those two, those two pieces there are the new features of the card. So Pam, let me ask you if there are any questions about uh, what um, is happening over the next few days. Yes, we've had a couple of questions come in. Okay. Uh, First question, should the release tomorrow be more at the district level versus the school level? So you, as, um, as leaders, you can share with other leaders of your, of your buildings, of your district. Um, you will have the link in, in a password that um, is a particular um, access to the card. Um, as long as you have a non-disclosure for that mm -hmm. data then uh, and people understand that it's an embargoed period then you, you're welcome to share um, because people are professional we trust that you explain to people that you trust and share that data with the people that you understand will not make that data available publicly. So um, if, if you have um, the utmost trust in your, the, your other leaders and uh, are able to share that with them, then you um, are welcome to, yes. And we have another question. Um, they understand that the school report card will not show the results from the school quality and climate survey. That's correct. But will they have access to statewide data in some way or a summary. They find it uh, helpful when they analyze local results if they know if the trends are similar to different trends in a larger data pool. So will they get anything with a state summary? So that that's I'm glad you um, mentioned that because we have two pieces of data that will not be included in the school report card and made public, uh, which is the quality of school climate and safety survey, as well as the ACT data. Those two pieces will not be made public during this, this release tomorrow and the next week. And those pieces of data are incomplete. So this quality of school climate and safety survey, as we've noted before, our students in alternate assessment were unable to complete the survey. Everyone else was able to complete the survey during that period between February and early March. And so we have a lot of the data, but the important voices from our students in our alternate assessment program are not included in that data. So without that, the department has decided that that's an incomplete data set and will not be releasing that information publicly. 
Now, you can, as uh, leaders, use that information internally um, in any type of um, school improvement plan, district improvement plan. But again, those data from the school, uh, the Quality of School Climate and Safety Survey, it's incomplete because those students' voices are not in there. So if you share that data, um, we would ask you to note the, the ca caution uh, on that data because it does not include all of the student voices. So uh, then secondly, the ACT is not going to be included in this release because the March 12th date that the ACT administered, um, I, I'm sorry, it was March 10th that we uh, were able to administer the ACT. We got about 95% of our students tested during that March date. However, not all of our students were able to complete testing. And as Sherry just mentioned, we've got now uh, multiple dates this fall for our students to be able to make up that ACT test date. So until we get this fall testing of ACT complete, then mm -hmm. we will not test uh, or release the ACT data. Now we do plan to release the ACT data once we get this round of testing complete this fall and get the results back from ACT. So we're, we're thinking sometime in, in the early part of 2021, we'll update the, the school report card with the ACT data from um, this last administration. So, so that's a long, uh, um, in-depth information about the fact that, that the state will not be releasing any summary data or any data on those two pieces because of those incomplete data sets. Okay, that's all the questions I have so far. Okay, and Pam, uh, so you wanna to very quickly move through this assessment accountability calendar? Yes, because we've already passed our noon. So we'll do this really quickly. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, there is a new uh, online calendar, the Assessment and Accountability Calendar, that's available for DACs and BACs to stay up to date with deadlines, trainings, assessment windows, and more. And we created them with a series of Google calendars, and they are available here on the assessment support page. And what you're seeing on the screen is a look at that calendar at the default. It can be viewed as a single large calendar or by individual calendars by topic or assessment. Now, we originally embarked on this project after requests were made by several DACs to have calendars that could easily be filtered or sorted and that contain details such as links to resources that were needed to complete whatever the task was. Now, we are updating these uh, weekly, sometimes more than weekly. Uh, by all the consultants in the Division of Assessment and Accountability Support. I would like to thank uh, the great team who helped develop this, of Chris Williams, Joy Barr, and Henny Bradley, for all of their hard work on this. You got the mention of this a couple of weeks ago in a DAC email. And if you're a video person, you can pop over back to that DAC email and look at how to do everything in the calendar. What you're seeing now is if we click on one of the events, this is the type of information that you'll see. You'll notice that every calendar is prefaced with what the calendar is. So if it's ACT, you would see ACT colon and then whatever the event is. In this case, it's training. And we're looking at the DAC monthly webcast. And then it has a description, gives you the links to get to the meetings and trainings page so you can pick up the PowerPoint uh, and later the video. And you can also go to the media portal to go to the live link to watch it live with us. Some people prefer to use a different view. So we can go from the month view to the week view. I like the week view. Uh, if I have lots of events or entries on a day. That way I can see everything at once. And notice that all of the 
all day events or things that cross multiple days are always at the top. Now let's go look at the agenda view for just a second. The agenda view is where you want to go if you're wanting to print all of the details of a meeting or an event. You can go to the agenda view to do that. There's a print icon up at the top, and you can print to paper or to a PDF. There's a checkbox in there where you can print all the details or not. It's up to you. Now, the calendars that are available, you can use any of these calendars. You can choose to look at all of them. They're on by default on the web page. Or you can choose to uncheck those by using the drop down on the upper right hand side of the calendar uh, beside the agenda view. You can use that drop down. Uh, there, one calendar has a little bit is a little bit different. That's a training calendar. The training calendar will have all of the trainings for each one of the assessments. So if I had an ACT training coming in November, you would find it on the ACT calendar. You would also find it on the training calendar. So there would be two entries. If you had both calendars open, you'd see both of them at the same time. Now, things on the training calendar that aren't on the others, that would be things like the uh, administration code and inclusion of special populations training that we do, or this DAC webcast. It only goes on the training calendar. You can also add any of these calendars to your own personal calendar app. There are the iCal links below that main calendar on the page. And you can add the calendar in if you prefer to use it that way, or you can still go back to the web page and use it there. Now, Jennifer, I'm going to pass it back to you for a moment, and I'm going to go check and see if we have any more emails that have arrived. Thank you, Pam. And thank you um, for all the questions that have come in today and um, the participation uh, on our DAC webcast. Uh, we are committed to continuing to keep you up to date with the most up-to-date information as possible that we have. Um, Pam, do we, have you had a minute to check? Yes, we have one question and it's about Brigant. Um, are they still expected or allowed to give this through December and January? And do they need to set a two-week window? Okay. Is there anything we can tell them? Sure, absolutely. We can tell you that uh, right now the Brigantz is open uh, to you um, to administer as your kindergarten students return to in-person uh, school. Um, we are leaving it open and being very flexible with the time frame for administration. Um, there are lots of districts that are now returning to in-person instruction, as well as uh, giving the option for some students to remain on non-traditional instruction. So for those kindergarten students that are returning in person, now is the perfect time to administer the Brigantz um, kindergarten screen assessments. For those students that are not currently returning to in-person instruction, we're leaving it open so that if they at some point decide to come back, then that administration of the case screen can be given at that time. Um, that uh, we are going to leave it open um, throughout um, this pandemic as it is evolving. Uh, we anticipate that um, some districts will um, wait until uh, later in this semester and even um, this second semester in uh, January to return. So we are um, monitoring district's decision about in-person instruction and then at a point in time when uh, there's more information available on the return of in-person instruction, then we will at some point make the decision to um, close the, the kindergarten screen um, for administration. And we will give our districts plenty of time um, and notice before that closure. Um, there is not from the state level a two week window. I mean, it is open. You can administer it at, uh, at any time. If you 
as the district assessment coordinator or the kindergarten screen coordinator would like to implement a two week window, then absolutely you may do that. That is a local decision. If that helps you give structure and guidance to your kindergarten um, screeners, uh, those people that are proctoring that administration, then you are well within your, your authority to create that, that two week window. So uh, the state is flexible and we continue to support you and your proctors as you implement all of state assessments. And that's all the questions that have come in so far. Well, that is wonderful. Thank you all for the such uh, thoughtful questions. We really appreciate your time, uh, your attention. We hope that you, your family, your uh, education community, everyone stays healthy as our districts are deciding to return to school. That's a very big decision, one in which that none of us take lightly. Um, we wish you only the best. Please stay healthy and we will see you here next month. Take care.